That's always uh, a, a, a really important and also challenging question. What is democracy? Democracy is... Democ mm -hmm. Wow, um, that's a difficult one. Democracy is a system that provides for contested values and practices over time. I would say democracy is not a given. Democracy is representation. Democracy is essential. Democracy in its most basic sense might be understood as the rule of the people. That raises two important uh, problems. Who are the people and what does it mean to rule? I think democracy is in crisis. Way too often it gets uh, contained into the idea of electoral politics. Real democracy is, is what happens in the street, you know? Everything that has been significant in the last 10 years and policy changes have come about through social movements. Change comes from the people always and only. And that's the meaning of democracy. Democracy has evolved, but both in a bad and good way. Democracy hasn't been tried and tested enough for us to make the argument that it's the best form of, of a political system. Current forms of democracy haven't been giving people what they need. Does the rule of the majority, is it capable of adequately including everyone's perspective? I think within like a settler colonial state, it inherently reinforces oppressive systems. I wonder though if if in that there there isn't something that that our ability to see that it's damaged, our ability to see that there are, are systemic problems uh, within the Canadian democracy also isn't a signal of something that's healthy. We talk about democracy being on the edge in the sense that we finally reached kind of a, a fundamental point where people realize that we really need to start making changes if we want to see things get better. Canada can go two ways. We can make some meaningful changes at this turning point, or we can just have more of the same. Democracy is a complicated thing because people are complicated things. Everyone has different value sets. Everyone has different morals. But at the end of the day, it's in all of that complexity, in all of that cacophony, where um, we find solutions. Okay, I'm just gonna test this mic. Yeah, it's working. Great. Hello, my name is Jennifer Andrews and I'm the new Dean of Arts and Social Sciences at Dalhousie University. And I wanna begin this auspicious event with a land acknowledgement. Uh, like so many at Dalhousie University, I work and live on Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. It is critical that we remember and acknowledge that we are all treaty people. I'm also grateful to be a guest on this land, and I want to, I'm honored to acknowledge the histories, contributions, and legacies of the African Nova Scotian people and communities that have been here for over 400 years. Having recently started my term as the new Dean of FAS in July of 2022, I'm thrilled to be here to introduce myself and this esteemed annual event. I come to Dalhousie from the Department of English at the University of New Brunswick, where I spent two decades as a researcher, a teacher, and I worked in various academic leadership posts. I'm someone whose scholarship actually examines, I have for about 30 years, the relationship between Canada and the US and the kind of political complexities around that relationship. Um, in particular, I look at the increasing challenges our democracies face. So it's a particular pleasure for me tonight to be able to be charged with introducing this year's lecture. It's a special pleasure in particular to know that this community, like all of the people in this room and tuned in online all over the world, are committed to supporting vibrant, thoughtful, thought-provoking community conversations by participating in events such as this. And you will note when you came in to the event, there were people um, exercising their democratic right to labor action, right? That is something that we support in a democratic society. And it's important, I think, to acknowledge that and to celebrate it um, rather than seeing it as an impediment. Um, so I'd, I'd just like to acknowledge that part of it, that you know we are here in part because we have democratic rights. 
We have an important goal here at Dalhousie, one of the pillars of our third century promise. We aspire to be a civic university that makes a global impact. The Stanfield Conversation Series builds on the legacy of the Right Honourable Robert Stanfield. It focuses on critical challenges to democracy and imaginative and inspiring responses to them. Through the conversations, we are tackling issues of national and international importance while drawing on a diverse array of world-class thinkers and practitioners of democracy to understand and examine the difficult but necessary challenges that will ensure that democratic modes of thinking survive and thrive. We are bringing this to our audience, alumni, and friends here on campus live and online all over the world. We wouldn't be nearly as effective in doing this without the support of our official sponsor, CBC Nova Scotia. So thank you to them. Not only as our esteemed moderator from CBC, but for the second year in a row, CBC Nova Scotia has supported us in marketing the Stanfield conversation to their audiences via their television and radio broadcasts, through a dedicated community page on their website, and through their social media challenges. You will have seen and heard interviews with students and with the speakers. So really exciting stuff on CBC. CBC has shared promotional materials as well as interviews and storytelling featuring tonight's speakers, as I mentioned, plus the students and faculty um, from Dalhousie's Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences in order to make this event a local, regional, national, and global success. So we want to take a moment to thank CBC Nova Scotia specifically for their continued support and partnership in promoting this event. We're very grateful. There are a few other people here tonight that I'd like to acknowledge. We are privileged to have many prestigious individuals committed to providing volunteer leadership around the achievement of the goals for the Stanfield Conversations. So in particular with us tonight is the co-chair of our advisory council, council, the Honorable Anne McClellan. And I'll point her out, she's in the front row. Um, we will have the pleasure of hearing from Anne later in this program, but for now I just want to say thank you to Anne personally and uh, on behalf of the entire organization for being here and for all you do to support this initiative. She flew in today especially for this lecture, which is wonderful. I also want to extend a big thank you and congratulations to George Cooper. Um, George knew Bob Stanfield personally and was the driving force behind the establishment of the Stanfield Conversations. Thank you to his leadership and the generous support he has secured. Dalhousie is the home to this series, which is both a catalyst and driver for these important conversations about democracy on a national and international scale. And I want to personally thank George. He actually set up a dinner last night where we actually got to meet and mingle with students, uh, faculty students and the speakers. And it was a really phenomenal event to witness um, because it provides these students with a really unique opportunity, a very thoughtful opportunity. So now what I'd like to do is introduce Catherine Martin to provide us with a traditional welcome. An award-winning filmmaker and producer, Catherine was welcomed back to Dell in 2020 as the university's first director of Indigenous community engagement, a position aimed at furthering reconciliation through collaboration with Indigenous partners in the region, particularly the Mi'kmaq. A Dalhousie Theatre alum, she is a member of the Millbrook Mi'kmaq Band. So I would like to welcome Catherine to the stage now. Quay. If you say Quay, you've, you've started learning our language. Quay. There you go. Midoa loktiok. Nin gadalinan maltaya and welegiskuk. That's how I figure out if there's any Mi'kmaq in the audience. So I listen. And, um, thank you for uh, inviting me here to do what is such a, an honor, especially after 500 years of not having human rights in this country, not being able to vote until 1960 and um, other things that the Indian Act in still today has some pretty controversial little policies in it. Um, but to come and be able to welcome you in our traditional way 
to the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq in peace and friendship as we agreed with um, the government um, in the 1700s. We agreed to maintain peace and friendship. And that's all we agreed. We didn't give up our land. We were not conquered. And I don't know, it seems it took the Supreme Court of Canada until the 90s to affirm that, yes, we always had a treaty, and we still have the treaty. And so I welcome all of you, and not, in, not to brag that, hey, hey, you know, this is our land. I welcome you to the territory that we will always welcome people to share in the earth, in the land that we live on. Sarah Denny was one of those incredible women in our lives from Eskasoni who held our traditional knowledge, our songs, our language when we weren't allowed to speak it in this country. She held it inside, and, she, and, and it wasn't just her knowledge she kept. It was thousands of years of oral history that she kept until it was safe to bring it back out and to teach the children. So she started with her 12 children, and quickly that spread. <laughs> and um, she taught me, uh, as well as others, when to sing certain chants and what they're for. And, and that's as important as singing, is knowing why and being given the permission to sing. And this is a chant that welcomes nations, all nations, whenever we gather to celebrate what we celebrate, that you're all here tonight. We just celebrate so much, and um, we welcome you here. So when I'm drumming this chant, don't worry, there's no translation. You won't have to take a test after. It's, it's like a meditation type um or something, but it's a chant, and it asks all those who have gone before us to help us and to help us find what it is we've come here together for this evening. And the heartbeat is the, the drum is the heartbeat of Mother Earth and the heartbeat of our mother. And so when we drum, we're singing um, and you're listening to a language that all of you knew before you came on, onto the earth, you were inside of your mother's womb, and this was your first language. So in Mi'kma'ki, we often ask people to speak from your heart, and, and when you do, it's the truth, because it's the language of your mother, and it's the language that all of us all over the universe understand.
Voltas. Okay, it's now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for the evening, Portia Clark. Portia said to me, what are you going to say about me? And I said, I'm not going to say very much. And she said, oh, good. So I, I'm, I'm just going to say a couple of things because I was told to be brief. Um, Portia is the host, as you well know, of Information Morning for mainland Nova Scotia on CBC Radio 1. She's an established journalist with a stellar reputation as a trusted interviewer who's covered some of the story, country's biggest stories throughout her 20-year career. And she began um, on the airwaves as a reporter, producer, and newsreader in Halifax in 1998. After 18 years with CBC working in radio and television in Edmonton, she returned to Nova Scotia in 2018, and we're very lucky to have her here. We're especially proud that uh, Portia is a Dow FAS alumna. She actually holds a BA in philosophy from FAS, um, and it's a point of pride for us um, that she is from FAS and represents FAS so amazingly well. So I just want to thank her, um, and thank her in particular for all she's done to make the Stanfield Conversations a success. Um, so I think now it's time for Portia and the other folks to come on up. And uh, I'm going to pass the stage over for Portia, to Portia, and ask her to lead the rest of the evening. And uh, I'd ask you to welcome all of our participants. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jennifer. And good evening, everyone. Good to be here. Good to see you. Yes, a Dow alumni. It's been about 30 years since I've been in this building. I feel very familiar. There's protesters here. The poster sale's happening in the lobby. <laughs> poster sale's a good thing. <laughs> but I'm extremely, I'm very excited to have this conversation tonight and for you to be uh, part of it as we focus on technology, technology changes, media fragmentation, and the crisis of democracy in America. It's very topical as we get closer to the midterm elections. And we're going to be looking uh, through the evening at some of the things that are driving this crisis in democracy, um, at some of the changes in technology and information sharing, some of which are happening here in Canada as well, and some of those parallels and some of the, the differences too. We know that technology uh, has helped advance democracy in some ways, but there is a dark side to it as well, which probably you're familiar with, and we heard some of the students reference in that opening video. Things like misinformation, disinformation, the uh, polarization of politics, the, the toxic incivility that we see on some social media platforms, which is creating more divide socially and politically than maybe it's bringing people together. So we're going to look at that. And as I say, the timing is fortuitous and, and not an accident that we're focusing on this as this year's uh, Stanfield Conversations given the midterm elections and what some commentators and observers are seeing as perhaps the most consequential election in U.S. history and given its history that's saying quite something. Some say that it may be on the brink of collapse in fact. So needless to say the stakes are very high and for us in Canada given our proximity in so many ways to the United States, we have a stake in this as well, and we'll be looking at some of those, those stakes tonight. Even if things are different here, it might be reassuring, in fact, to hear what some of those differences are. So, and you'll have a chance to, to put your conversation to some of our panelists, who I'll introduce in just a moment, but I just want to tell you a bit about how we're going to break this evening up. Uh, there's basically four parts to it. We'll introduce the panelists, we'll find out a little bit more about them, and we'll hear from each of them as they address changes in public discourse and the decline of democracy for about seven minutes. And then we'll have a conversation, the four of us, for 40 minutes or so, and then all of you will have a chance to put your questions to our panelists with the QR code that you were given at the start of the evening, or if you're joining us online through the usual ways of uh, putting questions to people. So. After that, we'll have a few minutes which each of our guests sort of to wrap up uh, what the takeaways from the evening are, things they want you to think about as you go about and perhaps as you watch the midterm elections on the 8th of November. So, why don't we introduce our 
speakers, both virtually and in person here at the McGinnis Room at Dow. Please join us virtually and on stage. Our panel includes Professor Elizabeth Dubois, Ron DeBert, Professor Ron DeBert, and Professor Kathleen Hall Jameson. Please give them a very warm welcome. <laughs> welcome to Nova Scotia. <laughs> and Kathleen Hall Jameson is joining us virtually. We'll see her in a moment on these screens. And there she is, Professor J Hall Jameson. Welcome to the room. Good to have you with us. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Ms. Hall Jameson first, who's joining us. Uh, virtually. She is the Elizabeth Ware Packard Professor at the Annenberg School for Communications at the University of Pennsylvania and the Walter and Leonore Annenberg Director of the University's Annenberg Public Policy Center. She's authored or co-authored 17 books including Creating Conspiracy Beliefs, How Our Thoughts Are Shaped, and Cyber War, How Russian Trolls and Hackers Helped Elect a President, which won the Association American Publishers and R.R. Hawkins Award the winner of numerous other awards for her work and research, some of which you can see on the bookcase behind her. <laughs> Kathleen Hall Jameson's the co-founder of factcheck.org and the SciCheck Project as well. Professor Ron DeBert is a professor of political science and director of the Citizen Lab at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. The Citizen Lab does interdisciplinary research at the intersection of global security, ICT, and human rights. The research outputs of the Citizen Lab are routinely covered in global media, including made in the front page of the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other media over the last decade. Professor Debert's the author of Black Code, Surveillance, Privacy, and the Dark Side of the Internet, as well as Reset, Reclaiming the Internet for Civil Society as part of the CBC Massey uh, lecture series. He was also appointed in 2013 to the Order of Canada and awarded the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Medal for being among the first to recognize and take measures to mitigate the growing threats to communication rights openness uh, worldwide. And Professor Elizabeth Dubois is an associate professor in the Department of Communication and University Research Chair of Politics, Communication Technology at the University of Ottawa. Her work looks at the political uses of digital media, including media manipulation, citizen engagement, and artificial intelligence. In 2019, she co-led the Digital Ecosystem Research Challenge, which brought together 18 research teams to look at how digital media was used in the 2019 federal election in Canada. She leads the multidisciplinary Paul Com Tech Lab, which includes political scientists, computer scientists, and communication students, and hosts the Wonks and War Rooms podcast. I love that name. <laughs> Thanks. And writes often for notable publications. So that is our panel for tonight. We're going to, as I say, hear some opening comments from each of them, and we're going to begin with Professor Kathleen Hall Jameson. So I'll cede the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's such a pleasure to be with you, albeit remotely. Let me set as a context an experience I had after the 1994 presidential election in the United States. That was a turnover election in our House of Representatives. For 40 years, the Democrats had had control and the Republicans gained control. That's called the Gingrich Revolution. It was the Gingrich turnover. And the Republicans did many things to the Democrats that the Democrats had done to the Republicans for 40 years. It was a period that was tense, and it was a period that was uncivil. And as a result, after about a year of that, the Republicans and Democrats and the leadership got together and said, this isn't acceptable, we've got to do something about it. And at, created a retreat in which they asked members of the House to come together in order to ask how they could restore comma T, that's with a T, in the House of Representatives. And they came to me and asked if I would write a report about the nature of the problem and the history of the institution. It was in that context, and that became the first of three retreats that they had, that I learned about Jefferson's rules for the House of Representatives. Now, all of this is relevant today because every two years, the House revotes those rules into place. And those rules have, have remained in their core unchanged from what Jefferson offered. There have been some amendments, but they haven't changed the fundamental concepts. One of the fundamental concepts says that when you're on the floor of the House, you cannot engage in personality. That is, you cannot attack the person that you are speaking with or the interlocutor you're engaging. You should attack the issue. You should engage the issue. You should not engage in personalities. You should not impugn the motives or integrity of the person to whom you are speaking. 
And that means that even if you believe someone lacks integrity, you don't say it. Even if you believe someone's a liar, you don't call them a liar. You may say that statement is untrue, but you don't impugn the integrity of the person. What we're seeing after the Gingrich turnover was an increased number of times in which someone broke the rules. And the House has an automatic process to censure someone who does that. It's a taking down process. The taking down process requires that the Republicans and Democrats agree that the rule has actually been breached. Otherwise, you're just going to have a partisan divide on whether or not they vote that this has been a breach of the rules. And of course, the Democrats who are in the majority are going, are going to win under those circumstances, or the Republicans in the majority are going to win under those circumstances, and you won't enforce the norms. Historically, the House had enforced the norms across party lines, and increasingly, we were seeing center votes, taking down votes on party lines. That was causing concern as well. The reason I'm mentioning this is because we institutionalized from the beginning in the United States rules of decorum in discourse that suggested that we would engage each other on the issues, that we would assume the goodwill and integrity of the people with whom we are disagreeing. And in the process, we would not destroy relationships upon which we could build to ultimately legislate, to find points of common ground that would make it possible to yield compromise. We have now largely lost that. The House still maintains its rules, but to the extent that those norms were also societal norms in our mass media, and to the extent that we no longer have a mainstream core mass media that speaks to most of us most of the time, but instead partisan channels on each time and a smaller mainstream audience, although still a sizable one, and social media environments in which there aren't the same kinds of norms that there once were in traditional media, and there certainly weren't, we once had at the House of Representatives. So a first change that we've seen is an erosion of the norms of civility and discourse in our politics, including the politics that takes place in public space. We not only have seen name calling, but we've also seen a rise in impugning the goodwill and integrity of others. And in that context, it makes it more difficult for us to find common ground in order to come to agreement on such urgent nation, national, national issues that we face right now as acting on climate change. And that's my first point. My second is that our courts also institutionalize practices of evidence and argument across time. Many of our founders were trained in classical rhetoric, and in classical rhetoric, we're trained in the essence of argument and evidence. Our courts have largely preserved those standards across time, and when you get an intersection between the partisan polity that now has discourse norms that do not approximate Jefferson's in any way, and they move into the courts because something is being adjudicated, you do actually see the power of discourse norms in which, for example, we don't admit hearsay as a legitimate form of argument. And you are required to provide evidence in order to sustain argument, in order to sustain cases. When Donald Trump and his supporters bring their case to the courts in over 60 cases, they lose because their case could not sustain the requirements in those kinds of environments for an engaged discourse that's grounded in argument and rules of what constitutes acceptable evidence. We need in this partisan environment to find ways to reinstate in our broader culture, in our political discussions, some of those grounding understandings that Jefferson brought to the House of Representatives and that we brought from our training as a country, our founders training and their role in the country in the classical understanding of what constitutes legitimate argument and evidence. And to the extent that our media structures are making that more difficult, they are more di making it more difficult for us to hold the country together as we navigate some of the most difficult times that the nation has faced since the Civil War. With that, I look forward to hearing the comments of the other two distinguished individuals who are part of this evening's presentations. Thank you, Ms. Hall Jamison. And I'll hand it over to you, Professor Ron DeBert. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Portia. And thank you, everybody, for coming out here tonight. And thanks especially to the Stanfield organizers. I'm really honored to be here as part of this conversation that we're having. And I guess I'll begin with uh, one or more stories uh, from a personal perspective. So I've been studying this topic of information technology, democracy, with a special focus on security issues for my entire professional career. I've been a professor for uh, 26 years now at the, at the University of Toronto. And when I think back uh, to when I first started, the primary, the overarching view of most people who studied this topic, and, and frankly, most people worldwide, was very enthusiastic. Uh, that the internet, uh, mobile technologies, social media, when it uh, came around, were contributing to a great people power 
uh, movement, uh, to liberation, to democratization. And some are going so far as to say that this was unstoppable, that it would lead to the um, dissolution of, of practices like authoritarianism. And, you know, this was happening at the end of the Cold War. Um, evidence seemed to be uh, bearing out that supposition. Well, if you fast forward to today, uh, I think the opposite is, is principally the case. And I'm sure a lot of people in this room are here today because you share a, a kind of angst about social media, what it's doing to our lives. Portia, you uh, referenced at the beginning of your remarks, I heard about the toxic kind of dark side of all of this, and it's certainly uh, palpable. Um, so my particular concern, the most acute concern I, I have actually around all of this is something that is easy, easily overlooked because it tends to operate in the shadows. And it is kind of an intervening set of variables, if you want to use that language, between social media and digital technologies on the one hand and a lot of the outcomes that we're seeing worldwide around things like uh, kind of toxic behavior and um, uh, you know, authoritarianism and things like that. And it is principally the emergence of a whole new set of industries taking advantage of the pathologies and insecurities around social media to supply to clients, both governments, and some many bad governments, I will say, and big corporate actors, the means to do things that used to be principally confined to the top secret agencies of governments. Things like espionage, subversion, disinformation, and other clandestine activities. Now, how did this all emerge? Well, we have to kind of take a step back to understand this, and I know we're gonna talk about some of this, but I'd like to get it on the table right at the beginning. We need to start with the business model around social media. So regardless of how the big tech platforms describe what they're doing, connecting people worldwide, putting information at our fingertips, um, you know, connecting friends and family members, all of those things, even right down to the most seemingly benign applications you use to get around the city or order food, order takeout, all of them have one overarching objective, and that is to gather as much information from us, their users, as they can in order to monetize that information, principally for advertising purposes. One way to think about this is we are the livestock for their data farms. Now, once you accept that, once that uh, reality actually kind of sinks in, several other consequences follow. First of all, in order to accomplish that business imperative, they have to keep us engaged. And this is where things get a little problematic. So in order to retain user interest, the big tech platforms, which have a great de degree of intimacy with the most private aspects of our lives, push forward and select out content that grabs our attention. And that tends to be human nature being what it is, sensational, extreme, emotional content. Now this is not some conspiracy undertaken by the engineers of Facebook or Twitter. It's the outcome of a simple set of experiments that are done on a, on a planetary scale, really, involving billions of people. Simple A-B experiments. Does this type of content grab you, or does this type of content grab you? Unfortunately, humans tend to be attracted towards things that are extreme and emotional. And that business model alone helps explain a lot of what we see. The second factor or characteristic around social media is its pervasive insecurity. Security has largely been an afterthought in the design of a lot of the technologies that surround us and that we take for granted. I'm sure all of you open your newspapers and read about massive data breaches. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, um, the founder of Facebook, has a phrase that I think sums up the philosophy that leads to a lot of this, and that is move fast and break things. So for many, many years now, practically two decades, the industry has thrived on pushing insecurities out in order to move products and applications out to users. So those two features, it turn out, uh, are the perfect ecosystem for malicious actors, those who want to cause harm, to further their aims, further the aims of their government clients. 
<clears throat> and as a consequence, what I am seeing, especially with my research at the Citizen Lab, is the sudden explosion of an industry <clears throat> that is deeply disturbing. And this is uh, private companies that are selling to government clients and other private actors the ability to undertake espionage, to hack into people's devices, uh, to engage in uh, reputation management or PR services, but which are essentially disinformation for higher practices. In, order, in other words, taking advantage of these characteristics of social media to further authoritarianism, to undermine democracy, and essentially uh, cause chaos. And right now, this industry is almost entirely unregulated, and it's very, very lucrative. So when you add all of this up, it paints a very, very disturbing picture. <clears throat> for someone like me who's been studying this topic for many, many years, um, I can tell you this is, uh, for me, the most acute problem around this conversation uh, that we're having today. How to fix these uh, deep tectonic forces that are leading us in this direction? I'm not sure I even have an answer for that because they are um, being contributed to by some very powerful social and technological forces that will not be easy to turn around. I will just conclude with one final story for you. So my research at the Citizen Lab, which is very technical in nature, we do this kind of digital detective work where we expose some of the wrongdoings that I'm alluding to in my opening remarks, and we become quite successful uh, at doing this. I've described what we do as a kind of counterintelligence for civil society from an academic perspective. Uh, we are, are unearthing abuses to human rights in the digital space. So successful have we become that we ourselves uh, were targeted by a private intelligence firm called Black Cube that was trying to discredit our research on behalf of a client that is unknown to me. Um, so this is the world that we live in now. It's, it's deeply troubling to me. And it's happening at the same time that we face extraordinary, catastrophic and existential risks on this planet. If this sort of behavior is happening, and not just happening coincidentally, but as a byproduct of the communications environment that we're living in, then we are in deep trouble. Thank you. Have us on the edge of our seats. Thank you, <coughs> Professor DeBert. <laughs> Professor Elizabeth Dubois, your opening remarks. Thank you so much. I am really excited to be here because this is a set of conversations that I think has been going on for a lot of years. I actually gave a talk at DAL before the 2019 federal election, and, and we were talking about digital democracy, and we were talking about all of the fears of, of foreign interference and political bots and fake news and all of the ways that these things were going to potentially undermine Canadian democracy. And, and we're still talking about that because what's happening is we're recognizing that people are always going to try and use whatever tools they can to gain more power in any political system. And the way social media, search, and other digital tools allow for... Uh, opaque contributions and participation means that it's really difficult to find those potential nefarious actors, those potential problematic uh, forms of engagement. And, and I want to start there, there with this idea of its engagement, because often we think about needing more engagement in our democratic processes. We need more people to be involved. We need more people to care. We don't want apathy. We don't always get to decide what kind of engagement we get or who's going to be doing the engaging, right? So I think we need to recognize that a lot of these things that we, I think, rightfully label as threats are part of democratic systems. And so what we need to do is find ways to shine light on the processes, make sure we create transparency and accountability within our systems, and that's how we maintain a strong democracy while still limiting the potential harms. So what I want to do with the next few minutes is do a little bit of definitional work on some of the things that I hear people talking about a lot and that come up in my own research. Uh, Portia, you mentioned I host Wonks in War Rooms, and the format of that podcast is I start by defining some 
political communication theory or concept for my guest, who's usually a politician or a journalist or some other political practitioner. And then we talk about all the ways it doesn't actually make sense in <laughs> like the applied setting. <laughs> so let's start out with those definitions. I mentioned political bots already. Political bots are automated social media accounts. They can be found wherever. Often we think of them as Russian bots because that's what first was popularized in news media. But in reality, there's all kinds of different bots. CBC has bots. CBC makes sure that things get posted on Twitter and Instagram and the website all at the same time. Super useful bots, really great bots. Then there are bots that are designed very specifically to confuse people, to make it impossible to use a hashtag on Twitter to organize a protest, for example, or to try and drown out really useful information that's coming by sending nonsense through uh, some channel of communication. There's also trolls and other kinds of... Uh, um, fabrication of support that we see. And so we have troll farms that are created to try and make it look like there's a whole bunch of support for one idea and not so much for another. And we've seen in elections around the world people who essentially work kind of like in a call center style setup, but their job is to pretend to be someone else on the internet and so dis discord and make it very confusing what to trust and undermine our institutions. Another term that I think often comes up is the idea of an echo chamber, often confused with the idea of a filter bubble. Echo chambers is this idea that we choose media and sources of information in a way that's gonna reinforce our existing beliefs. We get stuck in an echo chamber if everything that uh, we're pulling in just replicates what we've already sent out. And there's a lot of fear around that because our media ecosystem is such that we are empowered. We have a lot of choice about what to pay attention to and what not to. It wasn't that long ago that there were only a few news channels and you watched them during dinner and that was your choice, right? There was only a few radio stations and they all said very similar things. And now you have those, but you also have whatever online communities you go connect with. But it's interesting because the research actually shows that most of the time we're making choices that bring in more variety and that we, if we opt in, are much more informed. Filter bubbles, same sort of idea, you're on the internet, you're using Facebook, and you're getting only cat videos over and over again because you liked some cat videos and, and Facebook's like, you know what's gonna keep them on this site longer? Cat videos. Because they want, they want you to keep giving them data, as Ron was describing. They wanna be able to keep advertising to you. So these are a few different terms, and I'm sure there's gonna be more that are gonna come up, but I wanted to sprinkle a few out there because I think we talk about these in public discourse quite frequently, but we're often all talking about slightly different things. We're not necessarily on the same page. And that's one of the things that makes these kinds of discussions really challenging because there are so many aspects to it and so many different players involved and so many different interests. We can think about the kinds of new markets emerging, the kinds of new practices that are emerging. We can also think about the uh, well-established industries that are trying to adapt, you know, related to this idea of what are the threats to digital democracy are often conversations about what are the threats to news media and journalism. Because we recognize in a democracy we need journalism but we also recognize that established legacy media aren't really functioning the same way that they used to. And there's a lot of new competitors and that switches up who's part of the game and, and what the balance of power is. So the one thing I wanna end on before we open it up for discussion is just a, a reminder that as we go through this conversation, there's gonna be a lot of times where it's very tempting to blame technology for what's happening. And inevitably the question comes up, should we shut the internet off? <laughs> Which like, feasibility is a question there, but, but it comes up because we think about a lot of the issues with digital democracy as the digital part. 
it's the democracy part too, and it's the human part that really uh, has the impact, right? It's how we choose to make use of these tools, how we choose to interact with each other via these tools that really at the end of the day presents itself as threats or as opportunities. Thank you, Ms. Dubois. And I hope for those of you who are in the online audience that your interactions with us are on the positive side. And as you're listening uh, in the room, keep in mind uh, of questions that you may want to put to our panel a little bit later on in the discussion. But I want to turn to the opaque nature of some of the sources of information, disinformation, some of these foreign actors that you referred to. Ms. Hall Jameson, can you... Tell us a little bit how you would know, even if it was a, a Russian troll or a real person who is following you or who is giving you information, how do you tell that that's actually the source uh, of the, the person or, or the account that you're interacting with? One of, the reasons that we've seen, one of the reasons that we've seen an increase in uncivil discourse is the capacity online to be anonymous or pseudonymous, to pretend that you're someone you're not. And as a result, you're not clear whether you're dealing with an individual who is a national of your own country or is pretending to be. You're also not clear when you're dealing with anyone who's inside the country, if, you, if you're dealing with a US national or you're dealing with a person who, who's the person who they pretend to be. And we've known historically that when people are able to cloak their discourse in anonymity or pseudonymity, you increase the likelihood that the discourse will violate discourse norms because that kind of masking of who you actually are reduces your accountability. And as a result, there's no penalty for you to engage in it, at least not socially. So how would you recognize if this were a Russian troll? If the Russian troll were very adept at mimicking the language patterns, and in 2016, they were not. You could detect there was a Russian native language speaker under much of this because of their suppression of articles, for example. But if they're, if they're successful at mimicking the language patterns that you use, if they're successful at using the idioms that you use, then the only way you have to detect that is highly reliable is being a social media platform where you can track this thing back through various technological means. Or if you're the human trying to detect the other human without those platform capacities, Recognizing that what they don't tend to do is disclose high levels of personal detail that you could actually locate in time and space and track down if you did an internet search or a search within the physical confines of the area that they say that they're actually in. And what this means is the honest answer to your question is if they're very good at what they do, it's going to be very hard for you to detect it. But and the means that you have are means that they could actually overcome because they could create those kinds of biographies and those kinds of signals of specific detail that would in fact suggest that they have them when in fact they don't. They're sitting someplace, say, St. Petersburg. And as you say in your, your book, Cyber Wars can even develop, you know, personalities and opinions about very mundane or topical or pop culture kinds of things to, to create followings and appear to be a human being. And this infiltrated the 2016 uh, campaign in all kinds of ways. Yes. And that wasn't the only Russian intervention that actually made a difference. The argument in the cyber war book is the hacking by the Russians of the democratic content and the systematic release by Julian Assange through WikiLeaks to the American gullible American press, U.S. press, um, it changed the media agenda by changing the topics on which it focused in ways that disadvantaged Hillary Clinton and importantly created an alternative narrative when the uh, Access Hollywood tape was released, which could have derailed the Trump candidacy completely, which was the same day that the media learned that Russians were behind the initial hacking. So that release of that content altered that media agenda in, the, in ways in which, in ways which the benefit of Donald Trump because they depressed in the media agenda two factors that probably otherwise would have derailed his candidacy. There was, after all, in the United States, discussion at the top levels of the Republican Party of of taking him off the top of the ticket, moving up the vice presidential nominee and putting Condoleezza Rice into the vice presidential slot. That's how serious the Access Hollywood tape was. And so uh, in your work that you've been doing in terms of the opacity of some of these actors, how cleverly are they hiding mm -hmm. uh, who they are and what their motives are? What mm -hmm. are some examples of that? 
Well, I think, uh, first of all, um, when we look at this topic and around what some of the methodologies are of the uh, actors who are undertaking disinformation campaigns or hack and leak campaigns, it's evolving all the time. So uh, the last, you know, 10 years or so, many of the bad actors, let's just call them out there to simplify it, and, and the companies that actually service them have seen social media, have seen the internet as a kind of laboratory. And so they're experimenting. Uh, in the early days, things like bots, these artificial accounts, were quite common. But actually, they're fairly easy to discern. They have certain patterns or signatures. And uh, you know, groups like mine at the Citizen Lab and even the tech platforms themselves have developed pretty good methods, technical methods, to identify uh, the platforms do their best to take down those networks. But the actors have evolved. They realize, okay, well, that, that didn't work. It's not working any longer. I'm going to try something else. And they're getting more and more sophisticated, especially when you look at some of the high-end, um, most sophisticated type of, let, let's just uh, reduce it down to, to hacking, to spying. Um, back last fall, the Citizen Lab was able to acquire a very sophisticated piece of spyware um, that was sold by an Israel, Israel-based uh, firm called NSO Group, called Pegasus. And uh, this spyware enables government clients to surreptitiously take over any device in the world. They were exploiting uh, flaws in the device that, in this case, even Apple itself, a trillion-dollar company that devotes a lot of resources to security, was not aware of. And the exploit was able to uh, get inside a target's phone without any interaction by the user whatsoever. Uh, once inside a device like that, you are able to acquire an entire picture of a target's pattern of life. You can turn on the microphone, turn on the camera, you can scroll back through their history. Um, perhaps that's somebody doing it right now. <laughs> uh, well done. <laughs> so, um, so on the on the far end, on the most sophisticated side, we're dealing with very well resourced actors uh, that are making a lot of money, uh, putting a lot of resources and capabilities into doing the type of things that we're describing here. I just want to say one thing though about anonymity. While it is true that there is a correlation, I would say, between an anonymous communications and maybe uncivil discourse, as Kathleen described. I think we need to uh, not lose sight of the fact that anonymity has some social value as well. For example, if I am a woman in Iran right now and I want to get images out of the protests, uh, I, I would want to be sure um, that I would be able to get that out anonymously. And we need to re remember that when we're responding to some of the concerns that we have. We don't want to... Uh, move towards extreme solutions when it comes to dealing with some of the problems that we're talking about. Might make things worse in some cases. Mm -hmm. And of course, journalists work with, you know, two sources rule and sometimes give anonymity in cases where that is, yeah. um, is useful. In, to bring it back to the Canadian context, uh, for example, we saw the, the trucker convoys, the freedom convoys in, in Ottawa, and while not on the same scale, of course, as January 6th by any means, we know that some of that money was coming from the U.S. and was coming anonymously. Are there some indications that here in Canada some of those same kinds of forces are at play from what you've seen? Yeah, so... I mean, there does need to be a recognition that Canada is not uh, necessarily as high value a target as the U.S. is for foreign interference. But when we think about the convoy as an example, that foreign power was the U.S. on Canadian politics. Now, it wasn't an election time. There was nothing uh, there that uh, might have impinged one of our elections. It didn't reduce the integrity there, but we could imagine it happening during an election period. And we know that there is fund transfer uh, among smaller or ni more niche political communities across the Canada-U.S. border. And it goes both ways. There's Canadian money that goes into the U.S. to pay for social media influencers, for example, to share particular kinds of ideas within certain 
political communities. And this can happen uh, on the far right is where most of the tracking has been done so far, but it can happen on the far left or any sort of topic-based group that is not necessarily ideologically left or right, but that very invested in a particular topic. So certainly we can see those kinds of things. And I'm not bringing the kind of US-Canada relationship up to uh, pull attention away from or say that it is not an issue to think of China or Russia or some of these other states because certainly uh, it does seem that Canada is on the radar and could be a target for those kinds of things. But we haven't seen it to the same scale in Canada that uh, has been shown in the U.S. I'm not sure if uh, Ms. Hall Jamison, Professor Hall Jamison, used the term gullible when it came to journalists a few moments ago. Um, that, that, was, that was uh -oh. media now. No, no indictment of Canada. <laughs> <laughs> but we're talking about digital literacy and how we need to adapt to what is coming at us all of the time, and that includes us as journalists. We know that some uh, coverage got usurped by these manipulations that were happening in the United States election. So what do we as journalists and people in the existing mainstream media need to do or not do to keep some of those influences at bay, those very clever troll accounts that appear genuine, for example, that can make their way into uh, mainstream coverage? Yeah, I think recognizing that these are coordinated efforts. These are uh, not just... Uh, random individuals here or there trying these testing and testing things out, as Ron was describing. Often, these are uh, fairly well-funded, well-organized, concerted efforts. And so recognizing that that's happening and questioning whether or not this thing that looks like a story, it, does it look like a story or is it a story, right? Does it look like uh, grassroots or is it actually, you know, astroturf, that fake kind of uh, attempt to be grassroots when you really have been very calculated and, and put in place by some particular other actor? I think it's really important to recognize that there's going to be innovation in what these approaches look like. And that means there is no like, oh, okay, I took one course, I'm digitally literate, good to go. It's going to be constant and it's, it's not going to stop. There's this trend towards dropping, you know, so-called sexy tweets into stories to illustrate what the, the common person is thinking. Is that dangerous? I, I think so. Not only is it potentially dangerous, but... Uh, there's some ethical questions about it because when people are tweeting, they're not necessarily tweeting with the thought that their audience is all of CBC's audience or whatever, whatever outlet has pulled those in. And I, I actually did a study where we asked a representative sample of Canadians how they feel about it and their least favorite way that journalists make use of social media data is dropping tweets in. It's like the least favorite. They really enjoy getting to see like, oh, this proportion of people on this platform all feel this way or that way. That feels like a way of getting to know your wider community. But the idea of cherry picking one individual or another, people didn't like. It sits uncomfortably with them. And it's problematic when we don't necessarily know who's actually behind an account. Professor Hall Jamison, do you think we, after seeing what we saw in the 2016 election, are more or less susceptible to the same kind of thing happening again in, say, 2024, with hackers and Russian trolls having that kind of interference and influence on the campaigns and the election? Yeah, let me first speak to the idea that journalists like to try to get something that is representative it, to drop into stories. So they'll interview a person in Pennsylvania, and that's the person who stands in for everybody who's going to vote for one party or the other. That's how Russian trolls got their tweet, tweeted content into mainstream media, uh, because they, they managed to develop some persona that journalists saw con as convenient means of telegraphing a sentiment on part of a population in the United States. That was a sentiment that the Russian trolls were representing as being sentiment in the United States. So the Russian group called at 10 underscore GOP, which was pretending to be Tennessee Republicans, actually had more followers than the real Tennessee Republicans. And its <laughs> tweets were taken in media, in our mainstream reputable media, as representative of the views of Tennessee Republicans. And so the journalistic tendency to go for the so-called representative anecdote found, create an access way for those who knew how to manipulate that tendency in journalism. And I don't think that tendency has gone away. 
because journalists have to produce so much content so quickly. And because that gives them filler content that is dramatic, it's vivid if it's well written, and it looks like it constitutes evidence. I think that's an area that is likely to be exploited in the future. It's probably being exploited right now. We just don't know where. We know that we had one Russian troll who got substantial traction you know, out of just simply making celebrity commentaries until she wanted to start insinuating election information into the process. And so she legitimized herself as a persona so that she then later could start to insinuate content in that would be uh, that would undercut the election of Hillary Clinton. To your question about hacking, to the extent that the United States system after 2016 put in place through its secretaries of state many protections for our election infrastructure, the Russian penetration of our election infrastructure, they did penetrate our registration structures in 2016, was far less likely in 2020. In 2016, we don't know what else they did, if they did anything at all inside our election infrastructure, because we didn't have the capacities internally to detect. We now do, we did in 2020, and here's the irony. Because the Russians intervened in those structures in 2016, those protections were in place in 2020, and some of those protections were the basis for developing the evidence to say that the Trump claims about election fraud were unsustainable. So 2024, uh, more sophisticated hacking or trolls? I mean, is this already in the works, even though these defenses have been put in place from the lessons of, of uh, 2016? Uh, in other words, do you anticipate that this has been uh, subverted or there's just more sophisticated ways of intervening perhaps in the next uh, U.S. election? I think maybe maybe you're, you're not hearing me at this point. Okay. Oh, I, 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 excuse me. I, I thought you were addressing one of the other panelists. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm watching where you're looking, and you appear. To be, you appear I was to returning to my original question about about you know, whether I, I you think, think. I think the the, the protections ahead. are in fact, and I think also in 2018, the United States hacked back against the Russian infrastructure to in order to shut it down in anticipation of its manipulations in 2018, thereby increasing the likelihood that the Russians were aware of the U.S. capacities and the U.S. vigilance about watching everything that they were doing. Now, again, if they do it really, really well, they're not going to be detected and we're not going to know. But there are now many more protections in place that they were, and there's much more proactive action. The United States, of course, didn't tell anybody it actually had done that when it did it, but there's very good evidence in 2018 that they actually shut that operation down. Shall we say long distance across the digital capacities that were available? Uh, here in Canada, during the last election, some new um, accountability or transparency rules were put in place around advertising, for example. What did we learn from that that we might take into future uh, elections uh, here in Canada, Professor Dubois. Yeah, so ahead of the 2019 election, the uh, Election Modernization Act came into play. Uh, a few things were kind of simple, closing some loopholes around foreign uh, funding of advertisements or other uh, campaign activities, which are pretty simple, pretty straightforward. The, the less simple, less straightforward one is the online advertisement registry. And so what this does is say, uh, any time a political advertisement is going to appear on a website with a certain kind of threshold of, of people who are using it, uh, it needs to go into this registry. So Google decided, we're not doing political ads then, we'll just not be in this game. And Facebook decided, okay, well, we will create this ad registry. And so what it does is it shows when a political advertisement has been purchased, who it was purchased by, for how much, and who it was targeted towards, and then there's a, a copy of the advertisement. And the idea there was if there's going to be micro-targeting, you can't send different messages to different people and, and no one be the wiser. Uh, and it's a lot harder to share disinformation through paid campaigns uh, when journalists or whoever else could go check what was actually posted. And this is helpful, certainly, but a lot is missed because it relies on people to self-tag their advertisements mm -hmm. when they're putting them in, on the platform. And it requires people to, or it requires an assumption rather that all paid promotion of political ideas during an election campaign 
would be paid for through the social media platform's official advertising system or the website's official advertising platform. And that is not necessarily the case. For example, social media influencers often get paid either directly or via a marketing agency that now acts on their behalf. And there is pretty strong evidence to suggest there are networks of influencers for hire that have been active in India, in Brazil, in the Philippines, in Chile, and uh, there's fears that that same kind of set of tactics is going to be present I already potentially in this American election and certainly within the next elections uh, across the world. So, yes, there's some new transparency and it's great, but also there are still major gaps. Are there other ways in which regulating social media can backfire some proposals that could actually make things worse, Professor De uh, DeBert? Uh, yeah, absolutely, 100%. I mean... First of all, I would say we shouldn't let the social media companies off the hook because, um, first of all, they're, they're contributing a lot to the problem and they can do a lot to fix the problem, right? So that we should establish that, first of all. And in that context, I, I would just point out to people, there was a remarkable thing that happened, I think it was about a year ago, where there was a, an employee, an ex-employee of Facebook who became a whistleblower named Francis Haugen, who came forward and disclosed that Facebook itself knew about a lot of the syndromes and pathologies that, that we're talking about. For example, that anger actually generates more clicks. They knew about this themselves. Um, and, and, you know, while they may have taken some measures to try to, you know, stem that problem or mitigate it in various ways, fact of the matter is their incentive structure is entirely in the opposite direction. They're a business, right? So when they say, okay, we can set some, something up to kind of temper that tendency. It's like having the arsonist as also the fire service, right? Um, so I, I think it's, it's definitely true that for many, many years now, internet technology companies, social media companies have enjoyed a free pass. And that wasn't an accident either. Early on in the internet's history, there was a deliberate decision taken, probably for good reason back then, to kind of keep the government out. Let's, let's uh, leave this area mostly to uh, the druthers of the private sector. Um, shortly after the Cold War, there was a lot of uh, enthusiasm for unbridled capitalism and a lot of enthusiasm for technology. And the idea was, well, let's let them innovate. This will be good for everybody. And I think now we all recognize something needs to be done. We need to apply some principled democratic governance to this space. The question is, can we throw the baby out with the bathwater or make things worse? And I think that's definitely a problem. You see it um, uh, really all over the world right now in an attempt to correct certain things. Um, it might make the situation worse. So, for example, it might seem intuitive that we should have the social media platforms work very closely with state agencies, with law enforcement, so that they can help track down a lot of this bad behavior that's going online. Well, maybe, but then again, do we want to uh, supply more technological capabilities of surveillance to state agencies in the absence of proper oversight mechanisms? And here things get a little complicated. The f reality is that security agencies, intelligence agencies, law enforcement agencies worldwide are enjoying an extraordinary quantum leap forward in surveillance capabilities right now. Um, they, you know, we we're, were speaking earlier about anonymity online. Uh, to these agencies, forget about it. They can see everything that's going on. They have extraordinary means to peer into just about every aspect of our lives if they want to. The, the safeguard mechanisms that are at the heart of liberal democracy, meanwhile, the checks and balances that protect our liberty have remained more or less fixed. They're, they're from the Victorian era, if you will. Uh, so we have this great leap forward in sophistication capabilities of state surveillance at the same time that the checks and balances are, remain more or less fixed. So there's that enormous gap which leads to the potential for abuse of powers. So we have to be very, very careful when we're talking about specific solutions to the problems that we're identifying so that we don't make them worse or lead to unintended consequences that, that are really unsavory from a perspective of human rights and liberal democracy.
As we're talking about um, polarization, there is a distinction between polarization and radicalization, and if I can put that to each of you, what is that difference and what are some of the, the drivers of it, Professor Dubois? So polarization often is shorthand for, for ideological polarization or partisan polarization, and I think that that's a problematic first step, first assumption, because polarization basically is, you know, pushing towards two different poles, and that doesn't necessarily need to be left and right on some uh, ideological spectrum. It could be the difference between people who are opting in and learning a lot about politics and paying attention to the news and engaging in their political system, and those who are opting out and saying, this is too much, I have too many other things, this is not interesting to me, this is not my area of expertise, I don't feel comfortable in it, whatever the reason is. There's that kind of polarization, and I think that that is a really important type of polarization for us to recognize in a democracy, because democracies rely on folks to participate and understand and want to be part of it, right? We need people to not be so pulled away from their system because they've been uh, convinced that they don't know enough or they can't know enough or, or to be part of that community of the politically uh, engaged is too stressful, whatever it is. So I think that that's one way that polarization is very different from radicalization because radicalization is, I think, much more rooted in ideology or in particular views and perspectives, and polarization doesn't necessarily have to be. Radicalization uh, is often more about encouraging people to become more and more part of a particular community of folks who are radical in their beliefs and their views, and that is different from the idea of leaning towards one pole or another. Because two poles don't necessarily need to be radical. They just need to be in opposition. Mm. Would you like to weigh in on that? Sure, yeah. I, I would a answer that slightly differently and, and kind of question the terms from the outset because I think polarization, radicalization, what, what I see instead is uh, the definite spread uh, and and really the proliferation of alt-right, neo-fascist, uh, authoritarian behavior worldwide. And this is actually easy to demonstrate empirically. There's democratic black backsliding going on all over the world, and the spread of practices that we thought uh, at one point not that long ago were on the garbage heap of history are now making a comeback, and it's actually a very dangerous time right now. And I think there is no doubt in my mind that part of the reason for not the only one, because uh, it also reflects pre-existing grievances and ideological divisions and various prejudices that go back many, many, many decades and years. Um, but there is no doubt that the technological environment that we live in is contributing to this. Because if you go back to that principal business model, the overarching imperative, it's to push forward content that um, is emotional, that makes us angry, that divides us, um, and, and fuels this, this type of toxic discourse that we see and experience on a daily basis. There is no doubt about it. The companies themselves have documented it. They just don't want to tell you about it. And a whistle, thanks to a whistleblower, we know they have the evidence themselves. They've done internal studies. You know, there's a funny experiment that Francis Hogan uh, disclosed where Facebook created a fictitious account uh, it was a woman uh, that they called Carol that was kind of generic. She was a Christian from the Midwest. She had, you know, interests in, I don't know, yoga, knitting, bowling, or whatever. And they just started this fictitious account. And within, like, two weeks or something like that, it was full of the most insane QAnon, alt-right conspiracy theorizing. So they just let it go of its own accord. If you want to experience this yourself, uh, just go home tonight Put on any YouTube video that you want. It could be Neil Young singing Harvest Moon or whatever, Celine Dion singing a song or maybe some comedian, and just let YouTube's algorithms lead you along to the next video. I guarantee within about 30 minutes, 
you'll slam your computer down and run from your house <laughs> because this is the algorithm working as intended. So while we we're having nuanced conversations about causality and so on, let's not forget there's an enormous engine that happens to be uh, responsible for our public sphere, okay? And this, this is a business that is, has an overarching imperative to make money for their shareholders. And the way they are doing it right now is playing on the worst of our human instincts and behavior to accomplish that objective. Perhaps that brings us back to Professor Hall Jameson, your opening remarks about the decline in public discourse and how we are being driven further uh, apart, if you'd like to pick up on what Professor DeBeert was talking about there. Yeah, when one of the problems with polarization is the tendency under it to define an in-group and an out-group, and to define the out-group not simply as other and different, but as an enemy, and not simply as an enemy, but as evil, and not simply as an enemy that is evil, but an enemy that is evil and threatening and menacing to our in-group. And once you say that and you attach emotion to that because we have strong levels of affective polarization, emotion tied dislike and anger about that outgroup, we increase the likelihood that the tendency underlying the acceptable outcomes to deal with that outgroup, because after all, they're menacing us. And increasingly, people who believe those things then think destroy everything I hold dear is to justify violence against them or anti-democratic actions against them. And that, that process is highly problematic. And one of the pathways to that is a language that is a language that moves from enemy to evil enemy, to enemy trying to threaten us, to enemy that needs to be destroyed. And so the lack of comedy is, is in part a reflection of this move to see the primarily areas of difference, not simply in issue-based terms, but in moral terms. You, you've done some research on echo chambers and whether they actually uh, exist and work in the ways that we think we do, that we only are drawn to, maybe because algorithms are driving us in that direction, but content or people or opinions that we identify with. What has it actually shown? So a lot of the research into echo chambers shows that it's pretty overstated. We have this fear that we're going to use this wide variety of information we have access to uh, and this wide variety of channels of communication we have in order, uh, we fear that we're going to use it in order to reinforce our existing beliefs, in order to isolate ourselves from other ideas, to end up in those tight-knit communities that all share the same things and maybe spiral into uh, in some cases, violence. And, and actually, the vast majority of people don't interact in the ecosystem that way. So, like, great, excellent. Uh, but there is that small group who do. What I would like to say here is it's easy to get very afraid of the power of social media and other tools to connect us to like-minded people. But it's also one of the biggest benefits of these tools. And we need each other. We're humans. We're social. We need social connection. And these tools allow us to create community that can be used for a lot of good. And there's a lot of value in it. It's when it turns into hatred. It's when we lack tolerance that it threatens our democratic systems. So echo chambers, the, the general fear overstated. But the narrow groups that we can find ourselves in, we need to really be conscious of whether or not those are leading us towards believing others are less worthy or less important or less interesting or less uh, trustworthy. Because if we're starting to find ourselves in situations where our social community is reducing our capacity for tolerance, we're really in trouble. We're going to move to questions from the audience, which I'm getting on my, I'm not just distracted on my phone here watching TikTok, <laughs> 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 which we're getting from you in the audience using the QR code you were given. So thank you for those and also online. Uh, the first question uh, is for you, uh, Professor Dubois. Why don't we have the same level of political polarization in Canada as there is in the U.S. since we have access to many of the same kinds of social media or social media platforms? 
Yeah, that's a great question. We have a lot of the same access in terms of what what channels of communication we've got, what platforms are out there. We share a lot of media because we share a language and a very long border. Um, but there's some really important differences in our existing political systems. So if you grew up in the US, you probably grew up knowing that your family is Democrat or Republican. You grew up knowing you were gonna have to make a choice of which one you were. You grew up in a system where there was consistently tension between left and right, and that just doesn't exist the same way in Canada. At the federal level, sure, we've got two major parties right now, but the two parties we have right now that uh, kind of duke it out for power are not standalone. There's other parties that have come and gone over the years that shift the way that our left and right are divided up. We also have different systems at the federal level versus the provincial level versus municipal politics, which means that you can be affiliated with the Liberal Party provincially but the Conservative Party federally, and that is not going to force you to have some sort of cognitive dissonance because they're, they're different parties. And so I think from the very core of how we learn about politics in Canada and how we uh, are culturally connected to our political system it's different from the U.S., which is, by design, much more polarized. You have to pick one side or the other, pretty much. There's also different histories of uh, discrimination that are built into the American system versus the Canadian system, and I am in no way saying there isn't discrimination in Canada, because absolutely there is, but the histories uh, are, are different, which have led to different social... Uh, and cultural relationships to each other. There are different kinds of in-groups and out-groups that we connect with in Canada versus in the U.S., which has an impact on how likely we are to end up polarized or not. Thank you. A uh, question for Ron. Whom should Canadians worry about the most when it comes to corruption of the social media ecosystem? The Russians, the Chinese, the Saudis... Or the Americans? <laughs> <laughs> All of the above. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a good question. Well, I think uh, the Russians are pretty pre preoccupied right now, so maybe um, <laughs> we don't have to worry about them until such time as, as, as things uh, change over there. Um, the reality is that, you know, I, I think we have to worry about far deeper problems than a, a handful of states. And in fact, Thinking about the problems in a kind of state-centric kind of way, I think, is misleading because what we're really dealing with, I'll be frank with you, you know, I was trained as a, as a professor of international relations, which is, for those of you who study from that perspective, it is very state-centric. The world is governed by big powers and they decide how the world is run, basically, for better or for worse. But it seems to me these days it's, it's better described as being run by a, a transnational class of gangsters, frankly. Um, so if you really want to understand the world uh, today, think not of like Bismarck or Churchill. Think of the villains in James Bond movies. <laughs> Doctor No. Uh, I'm not joking, actually. Um, you know, there, there has been a, a, a process over the last couple of decades that I think has its roots in in liberalization and, 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 you know, unbridled capitalism. We have enormous disparities of wealth. There are these huge oligarch billionaires that control so much, and they're operating with impunity. And there is a huge private sector that I was describing early, earlier that services their malign intentions. And they're getting away with it because they can operate in a globalized space and evade jurisdictions of any one country. Um, so if, I, if you're asking me, what should I be most afraid of? It would be uh, these villains. And I, I think that we need to crack down on them. Well, thank you very much. I assume you're not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a question for uh, Professor Hall Jameson. Who are these shadowy fact checkers who can slap posts with a label of misleading content? Who, who watches the watchers? Now, I know you are one of the fact checkers. <laughs> Not shadowy at all. There's she created well the organization. <laughs> <I> know, right. 
the uh, the fact the fact checkers if they are honoring their own norms are not shadowy they tell you who they are they tell you where they are <laughs> they tell you where they get their money and they disclose the sources they're using to adjudicate as best they can uh, contention in which one side is claiming that the best of what is knowable is X and the other side is saying the best of what is knowable is Y. And in the process, they, they disclose with links the sources that they're using, which means that that transparency should let it make it possible for the person who is the reader to determine whether the person agrees or not. So I, I would dispute the premise of the question. Uh, Factcheck.org, <laughs> which I did co-create, which does run in my policy center, which I do continue to supervise, I don't think meets those criteria. Who watches the watchers? The readers do. Because if we're if we're transparent, you are going to, in the process, be able to see whether or what, what we are doing is justified by the evidence that we're offering. And if you object to what we're doing, we and you respond to it in a way that's civil and engaged about the issues, we in our weekly newsletter will post your, your questions, your responses, your concerns, your disagreements, and we will engage you because our model of how this is done is one that assumes that we are fallible as is everyone else. And this is an enterprise in which we're collectively trying to determine as best we can, what can be known about a given subject. Also, at least in our fact checking operation, we don't say that very often uh, that something is categorically true or something is categorically false. Most of the time, what we are doing is contextualizing things because things have been omitted that if contextually understood differently would yield different kinds of conclusions. So I have some disagreement with some of the call from our colleagues in the fact-checking movement who are a little more categorical than we are about how they, they assess what it is they're doing. We don't think the role of fact-checkers is pontifical. We think the role is to make the best use we can of our time to help people understand what is available to be known, which they would be able to know in their own right if they took the same amount of time to do the same amount of work. Professor Ball, you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I think one thing that's important to add to this is there's a difference between the label that gets thrown on to something and the fact check that's done. And sometimes you see the label and then the fact check is connected to it and or it says because this has been checked, this is why we've labeled it. But sometimes there isn't that connection. And COVID-19 is a really good example. A lot of the platforms were really, really hesitant to label anything uh, as mis- or disinformation or to take down anything until the pandemic hit. And then all of a sudden, there was broad public support for platforms to intervene because there were these really serious immediate health risks. And so what we saw very quickly was platforms were willing to label things like, hey, this is about something that is up for debate right now. There's a lot of mis or disinfo going on around it. So we're just gonna tell you that every time anything that might be related to COVID shows up. And that went on for a few months until things started to settle into a kind of a new groove. But it is, I think, important to know that sometimes we're still seeing things on different platforms that have been automatically labeled usually through simple keyword identification. Sometimes it's through uh, slightly more sophisticated approaches, but it's an automated approach. And it's not until there's the actual link to the fact check that it becomes this sort of um, curated information that's been provided for you to add that context. So verified or... Yeah. Okay. May I jump in on, yeah. on this just quickly? Um, so this question I think is really, really important when it when we turn to the issue of solutions to all that we're talking about. So fact-checking and who's watching the watchers is the way you phrased it. So there are two important institutions in society that we need to flag here. One is investigative journalism and the other is centers of academic research, advanced research. Both have eroded in various ways. So investigative journalism, we all know the story here. There's just not enough resources, not enough funding for it. Uh, capacity is, is depleted in just about every news organization worldwide. I'm sure you could speak to that. Universities, on the other hand, which have as their principal mission to do evidence-based research in the public interest, have become or are becoming vehicles for big industries and pathways for employment. 
That's how most universities are increasingly justifying themselves. And I think we need to recover both of those institutions. If you look at universities, uh, the extent to which the humanities, the social sciences, philosophy, uh, those disciplines have been hollowed out in favor of engineering, sciences, technology, the functional disciplines to keep the machine running. Nothing wrong with those disciplines. We need people doing those things, but we need to not lose sight of the fact that the core mission of the university is as a public institution of higher knowledge and learning, and that's been eroded systematically. So if we're going to recover some of this, we need to start there. As a philosopher and a journalist, hear, hear. <laughs> That, that was an easy one for cheap applause. I knew that. <laughs> I just said that. For you. <laughs> uh, a question for, for you, Kathleen, Professor Hall Jameson. The U.S. Supreme Court is going to make an important ruling soon about Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act dealing with platform oh immunity. <laughs> it has the potential to reshape the Internet as we know it, especially information disorders. In your opinion, to what degree should social media platforms be responsible for hosting and promoting harmful content that could incite offline violence? How does Canada's approach compare to uh, the Americans? So I think I'm going to let somebody question. else answer the question, how do the two, uh, the two systems uh, relate to each other and what are their... their uh, their differences and similarities. I think giving the platforms blanket immunity for everything on the platforms is problematic. Uh, whether 230 and the changes are, are going to make a difference one way or another is actually better answered by someone who spent more time looking at that issue than I have. I have not spent a great deal of time with that. And so I'd like to, to refer this to one of the other panels. Okay. Fair enough. If either of you has any, you has want, I can take a crack. Now. You can take a crack. Go for it. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Section 230 is a rather obscure piece of U.S. Uh, regulation that actually gives the big tech platforms a degree of insulation from liabilities of uh, based on what they people post on their platforms. And I, I think that um, you know the interesting thing here is definitely the case that we need to tinker a bit uh, with uh, some of these um, immunities that the platforms have. We need to find ways uh, to have them better police their own networks, um, but throwing it out would be, uh, I think, a disaster, actually. And what I really am concerned about is, you know, a byproduct of all that we've been talking about in the last hour and a half is the fact that you have just this toxic ideologically divided discourse going on where you can't have a sensible, rational conversation about something so important as this nuanced piece of legislation. So I fully expect some kind of crazy ruling will come out of the Supreme Court. There was a time when Donald Trump was actually tweeting out, abolish Section 230, which ironically would have meant, likely, he would have been kicked off their platform more readily than he eventually was. And he didn't realize it because he's, you know, Donald Trump. So um, this is why, you know, the solutions to these problems are, there's no single simple silver bullet that's going to solve a lot of these deep-seated problems. With one exception, I would say, which is the underlying business model. We desperately need alternatives to platforms that are driven by this attention-seeking, algorithm-driven surveillance capitalism model. There's no reason why, as Elizabeth was saying earlier, this is good stuff. We need to be able to communicate with each other. We're, we're human beings. We have a lot of shared problems on this planet. We're going to need something like the internet to solve those shared problems. But the one we have now, with social media being dominant, is totally dysfunctional to those larger aims. So we need an alternative to those business models. One way to do that is introducing competition. Thank you. Well, this question follows on what you said there. Politicians are also on social media from Trump's tweets to AOC doing live streams on Instagram. We now have instant access to politicians. How is this helping or hurting democratic systems? And uh, I'll put that to you, Ms. Hall Jameson, first. I would like to narrow that to ask about those sites, those places that are encrypted. So one of the things that 
I want to be able to do as someone who works in a fact checking organization is to be able to see the discourse that is there so that you know what is reaching people so that if you, you think that there's something problematic about it, you are able to examine it in public and everybody else can look at it as well. So the rise of encrypted channels has made it impossible for journalistic outlets to do what they have attempted to do historically, which is to find out what candidates are saying to audiences. And that combines with another capacity because of all the surveillance and all the gathering of data about us. Because those people who hold that data now know more about us than any human being has ever known about us in our history, knows more about us than most of our friends and family members do. That means that that capacity is now institutionalized in structures that can be harnessed to messaging to us in encrypted environments in which we are being told things that are very tightly targeted to everything they know about our dispositions, our needs, our positions, who we are, what we want to hear. And no one is able to watch that when this is an encrypted process in order to say, but you know, they just told you something that was blatantly untrue given what is known and available as is know and is knowable. And so I worry about an environment in which a whole swath of political discourse can now be very narrowly targeted to manipulate us with a capacity that those who wanted to manipulate have never had before because they have so much information about us both as aggregated groups and increasingly as individuals. But maybe it's less about what we see so obviously, but what we're, we're not seeing um, and how that's being targeted. If either of you would like to uh, address that, please do, or I'll ask you a, a related question, which is, should we uh, stay awake at night, worrying about all of this, and throw out our devices? <laughs> so the idea that politicians, campaigns, whoever, have way more information about us than they ever did before is, is true to a certain extent. Like, there's a lot of data. The, the campaign machinery that goes into collecting data and making use of it and working with data brokers, certainly it is impressive and a little bit scary. But I think it's also important to remember that politicians have gone door to door for a very long time, and they ask a lot of personal questions when they get to the door, and there's a lot of data that has been part of campaigning since, well, well before social media, we'll say, right? So I think it's also important for us to recognize that campaigns and politicians having information about us can be used to represent us better. When we don't know how that data has been collected, when we don't know whether or not it's been paid for, when we don't know who it's being shared with, that's when I think the problems arise. So I don't necessarily think that we need to be afraid of the fact that data about us is being used in politics, but we do need to be afraid of when it's being used in opaque ways and uh, there's a lack of transparency and accountability for it. So one of the other things that came up in the Election Modernization Act was this very toothless <laughs> requirement for political parties to have uh, a privacy statement about how they're making use of people's data. And the problem is there was nobody checking it and there was nobody checking to make sure that it actually was being applied, so it's useless. But the idea was there, like it's on the radar, right? And so I think that that's something that we need to bring into these conversations because often we do get to that follow-up question of like, should we throw our devices out then? And I think the answer is no. I don't think that is a practical response. I don't think it is feasible. And so I think we need to be looking for other solutions. And in this case, transparency and accountability are, are the key things that are going to allow us to continue using our devices, but also have a democracy we can rely on. Well, just finally, um, since we've reached quarter to uh, nine here, these devices are in the hands of a lot of, of young people. And this final question, how do you think our younger generation will be affected if they grow up consuming this disinformation, these posts from troll bots, social media algorithms, that, as you've all referenced, this extreme emotional uh, content? That's my, my final question. Perhaps Professor DeBert, if you'd like to jump in. Well, obviously, I'm worried about it. By the way, if you don't want to stay up all night awake, don't turn on your device. That's like an old yeah. adage. Go, ha go have a <laughs> glass of light, warm milk right? instead. Yeah. <laughs> go back to sleep. Um, but I, 
Yeah, I, I'm obviously, um, if I haven't got the point across by now, I'm failing. I'm obviously very worried about the future. And I also think, however, that uh, the technology holds great promise. There are so many things that were demonstrated, for example, even during the pandemic that showed maybe some of the promise of the technology. So I really do think when it comes to um, younger generations, we need to um, get back to some basics. And, you know, I explained about investigative journalism in university. I, at the end of my book, Reset, I, I went on at great length at the end of the book about the importance of civics. And I think there is, a, 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 you know, an absence right now in educating especially young people in the importance of what it means to be a citizen, both in terms of rights and responsibilities. And again, it's one of those things that was very customary at one point in time, and maybe it wasn't done uh, always appropriately, and there are lots of old-fashioned things about it that we could dispense with, but at the core of this idea is something pretty important that we need to encourage younger people to do. Um, there are a lot of things obviously going on in social media, on, on tech platforms, that would be uh, emotionally and otherwise destructive to young people. We definitely need to be mindful of that. The worst among them, though, again, is really this basic business model, this overarching imperative to gather information. And the companies really are relentless, and this is where I see most of the harms affecting minors, because there are applications that are you know, designed and, and really have this in, insatiable uh, quest to gather up as much information as possible, and they are routinely targeting children in order to do so. And, and, you know, frankly, parents have a responsibility here too. I see across my own extended family, people, well-intentioned people who are photographing and in the process of doing so, collecting biometric data of their children, every aspect of their life throughout every part of their day. It's, I love seeing it too. I like, oh, there's my nephew. He's like making cupcakes, right? Um, but this is all being fed into a distributed machine that is going to structure the preferences mm. of that young child as they become an adult. So we really got to think that through. That's a broken system. Thank you. Professor Hall Jameson, oh, any thoughts about let, that? Yeah, let, let, let me piggyback on the, the uh, civic knowledge and, and add to it a, a sense of civic disposition. In the United States, we do the big survey every year for our Constitution Day that asks the question, what does the public know about what the Constitution says in the United States? Most of the people in the United States can't name the three branches of government. Most can't name the freedoms protected by the First Amendment. Most don't understand the checks and balances that mean that we need an independent judiciary and we need the prerogatives of the other branches defined so that we can have the checks and balances actually work. So in the presence of that level of ignorance, when you say, uh, if we have a bunch of popu unpopular Supreme Court decisions, should we just get rid of the Supreme Court? The answer is statistically more likely to be yes. <laughs> so we have a challenge in the United States in an absence of civic knowledge of things that are foundational that do act when they are known to increase the likelihood that we'll hold our system together. But tied to that, I think, is the need for civic disposition. And I'd like to move into my closing remarks by saying we saw an example of what a civic disposition looks like as this evening began. We saw a lovely moment in which there was an exchange between, between two individuals one individual expressed gratitude for being a guest on land that does not belong to the people who are in this university in particular, this hosting this event. The other said, you are welcome here, and then talked in terms of Mother Earth, a common idea that we could share across those communities. That is a lovely instance in which a, a people that could be arguing that they had been discriminated against, disadvantaged, and they want their land back instead are demonstrating a communal disposition, a civic disposition toward creating a collective community in which in common, they honor Mother Earth with a common heartbeat and a heartbeat that we are experiencing individuals as individuals. I'd like to see more moments like that in which we revivify our sense of collective community. I thought you did that beautifully this evening.
appreciating the, the, the sentiment you expressed there as part of your closing remarks, which means we could either move to closing remarks unless you have some final thoughts on uh, the next generation and how they're being influenced in this media uh, environment. You mean we have to follow that? <laughs> a, I offered a bridge <laughs> or an exit. Man, oh man, that's a yes. steep challenge. Mm. Well, I'll offer one real quick bit of hope when we're thinking about how this impacts young people and future generations, and it's that the folks who have grown up with all of these threats to their information environments are the ones who are most digitally literate. They're most aware. They're most critical and skeptical. And being critical and skeptical are two real essential survival tactics in this kind of information environment. Thank you. And for final uh, remarks, we are going to wrap up with a few thoughts. Takeaways for people to bring home with them as they are throwing out their devices or not. <laughs> Don't throw out your devices. I think they'll be essential to our future and to accomplishing what we need to accomplish, especially around thinking about our stewardship over this planet. Uh, we've got some big problems. Um, I will just say the, the future is not uh, set in stone, um, that we're in charge of our own destiny and collective action, and we can all uh, make our lives better and, and improve ourselves by doing the sorts of things that Kathleen pointed out. And I, I just love that sentiment there, so I will leave it at that. Yes, appreciate it. So in my closing remarks, I want to address a bit of an elephant in the room, and that is... The, the counterpoint to a lot of the things we've talked about today is, right, but that infringes free speech, right? Like, if you're going to deal with disinformation, that's preventing somebody from sharing their ideas, and they have a right to it. And, and what I want to say to that is that I think framing it as infringement of free speech is a real problem, and it's actually a political tactic, because free speech is a wedge issue. And what we're actually talking about is an information environment where... All of our information is already controlled by someone or multiple someones. Our information environments are shaped by the algorithms that social media and search have created for us, by the advertisers that want to make money off of all of the personal data that those platforms have collected about us. And I think we need to start with the assumption that information is controlled and then work from there to understand ways of creating systems where we shine light on how our information environment is controlled, rather than debating whether or not it should be. So uh, I realize bringing up free speech and then running is a little bit mean, <laughs> but it's a really important part of this larger conversation, and I thought we would be remiss to, to leave without having mentioned that. Thank you. And thank you to all of you for this invigorating discussion. Uh, tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. You've given us a lot to, to think about and instead of being passive to actually actively agitate for some of these changes or perhaps for some of you who are uh, in the audience and in, in your academic journey getting involved in some of those things, uh, investigative journalism, um, or politics in a different way, or creating, just in the conversations you have with each other, a more positive way of, of finding discourse and, and compromise. To close the evening, we'd like to hear some final comments from Honorable Anne McClellan, who is here. There may be some of you who are also DAL alum here. Ms. McClellan is DAL alum, but not all of us have been chancellors at the university. <laughs> she was the seventh chancellor here at Dalhousie University and insisted that I not read her entire bio, so let's just please welcome Ms. McClellan. Good evening, everybody. It is a great pleasure to be here this evening. As was mentioned uh, earlier, I am one of the two uh, co-chairs of the advisory council that works very closely with the university and in particular the political science department to uh, develop these conversations in democracy and to present them. 
And unfortunately, my co-chair, the Right Honorable Joe Clark, could not be here this evening. But Joe and I were emailing earlier today because I wanted to know exactly where he was in the world and what he was doing. I'm quite nosy. And, <laughs> but I thought it was appropriate for me to know where my co-chair was on this special evening. And in fact, not surprisingly, he is, well, maybe surprisingly, he is in Switzerland, but he is at the annual meeting of the Global Leadership Foundation, which, in fact, is talking about democracy. So even though he is not here with us this evening, Joe is very much involved as he has devoted so much of his life to uh, thinking about democracy, acting upon democratic principles, and I think sharing some of the concerns that we have heard here this evening. So I just wanted you all to know that Joe is very much engaged in the democratic uh, mission. I do want to say a few words about the Advisory Council, and it is a group of respected Canadians from across the country, and in fact, some members of the Advisory Council are here this evening, and I thank you uh, for uh, joining us this evening, and they volunteer their time um, to do, among other things, a little brainstorming around what the theme of each of our annual conversations should be. And they are going to start that work in terms of the third annual conversation in democracy tomorrow. <laughs> so if any of you have any thoughts, uh, advisory council members, or those, the general audience here this evening, around what you would like the conversation in honor of Robert L. Stanfield to be next year, please reach out to Joe and myself or reach out to the university with suggestions. I do especially want to think, uh, thank George Cooper. George, wave to the crowd. I'm bossy. I'm a liberal. I'm bossy. Right? <laughs> George and I get along so well because, of course, not to bring partisan politics into this, but George is a well-known progressive conservative, and I guess I'm something of a well-known liberal. But I think democracy uh, does well when people across political ideologies are able to have respectful, informed conversations. And certainly Mr. Clark and I and George have had many, I think, respectful, informed conversations about democracy and other things. But there would be no Robert L. Stanfield lectures with or conversations in democracy without George. So George, on behalf of everyone, a very sincere thank you. George decided now three or four years ago that in fact, Mr. Stanfield was such an important part of Nova Scotian and Canadian life. Mr. Stanfield was a person of integrity, a person who believed in working toward the public good, the common good, without rancor, without particularly being very partisan, right, George? He always put the common good before partisan interests. And George, looking around our environment, realized that there was nothing here at Dalhousie or even in the larger public space that spoke to some of Mr. Stanfield's most profound and loved interests. So George went about across the country, uh, in fact, talking to many who remembered Mr. Stanfield and was able to bring a group of, of people together who not only are committed to democracy, committed to the memory of Robert L. Stanfield, but in fact were able to put uh, financial support behind this endeavor so that these lectures will continue uh, for well into the future here at Dalhousie. So George, a sincere thank you. Just a few other quick thank yous. Big thank
thank you to Dalhousie University, Dean Andrews, wherever you are. When I put on these glasses, I can't see more than <laughs> there. So <laughs> Dean Andrews, the planning committee led by David Black. I do know where David is sitting. And clearly uh, and obviously Catherine, uh, Catherine Freelbeck, uh, who is the chair of the political science department. And everybody, all of us were ably uh, was supported by Anne Swan and everybody else behind the scenes who made these, uh, uh, this conversation uh, possible. I also obviously want to thank our three outstanding conversationalists this evening. First of all, Kathleen Hall Jamieson. Professor, thank you so much for being with us this evening. And we do hope that you come and visit us in person sometime soon. Ron Diebert from the Monk Center and the University of Toronto. And Elizabeth Dubois from the University of Ottawa. Thank you all. I think this was, I was just saying to David Black quietly, this is such a stimulating conversation, but a respectful, informed conversation, uh, which we need so many more of to ensure the strength and vibrancy of our democracy. And you said so many complex, important things, but I, I guess in a way I always uh, will return to, I, in a way it's almost embarrassing, the simplicity of the fact that democracy is about people. And people, Elizabeth, you said, have choices. You said that at the very beginning. But people, I think, only if we, if we are to have vibrant democracies, people have to make informed choices. They have to be vigilant, but they cannot be vigilant if they are not informed, because they don't know what the dangers are and what to watch for and who to trust and who not to trust. And I find it interesting at the end of the day for me, that takes me back to the importance of civics. It takes us back to where so many of us, at least of a certain age, began. Learning about what it meant to be a good citizen and learning about what it meant to uh, take up the responsibilities uh, of being a good citizen. So for me, I mean, that's so simplistic, I, it's almost embarrassing for me to say that after this amazing conversation. But I thank you because that's what you took me back to. And I think that is so important for everyone to remember. And Portia, you and I have known each other from another life. Uh, we knew each other in Edmonton, Alberta. It is wonderful to see you again. And what an amazing moderator, ladies and gentlemen, this evening. Thank you, Portia. So with that, thank you all very much. If you have suggestions for next year's conversation, be in touch, let us know, and we look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you, Anne.